Well, I want to transition just a little bit based on what you gentlemen are talking about. And let me ask you, and and Carl, you talk about this in this book, Be Thou Prepared. How safe do you think our churches are? Now, I mean, could not just a couple of attacks against, say, a mega church or any church. I mean, it could virtually close them down as, as people would be afraid to attend. This could be Islamic extremism coming against Christianity. So tell me, how safe do you think our churches are? I mean, be you can be honest, you can be blunt. Yes. Thank you. Oh, I will, and I thank you so much for giving me this platform. Well, again, I'm a former law enforcement officer and a longtime senior pastor. For many years in our church, we've had a massive security ministry and security team. And, and of course, on your radio program that goes to out to the world, I'm not going to give away how mm-hmm. we do it mm-hmm. <laughs> in all the details. But I do give several chapters in my book explaining to churches how to provide for themselves. And the guy that wrote the foreword for my book, Charles Van Wick, he wrote the book entitled Shooting Back, and he tells his story in my book. He was in a church in South Africa, 1,000 people in attendance, when terrorists burst into the church, and their plan, they found out later when they finally got some of them arrested, they were going to kill all 1,000 people. But this one guy, Charles Van Wick, happened to be armed with a concealed weapon and shot back and frightened the terrorist off. He went out, chased him outside, hit one of them. They finally arrested one. Fourteen people died. The terrorist lobbed a hand grenade into the middle of the congregation and then were opening up with automatic rifles. But because one guy had a pistol with six shots in it out of a thousand people, he was able to keep it from being 1,000 people dead. So you're right. This is something that needs to be addressed by America's churches. And as of the time we are speaking right now, all the statistics say, and all of the security experts, church security experts, tell us that the vast majority of America's churches are unprepared for something like this. However, I think many are beginning to catch on, All right. and I think many are beginning to tighten up and to do some good okay. things, and that's another reason I wrote this book. Several chapters are devoted to how to do this stuff. If this happens to the church down the street, First Baptist of what you feel in the city, how are you recommending they prepare? Yeah, well, I could do a two-hour seminar on it, but let me give a a, a one- or two-minute synopsis. Mm -hmm. They have to communicate with each other. They have to have meetings and conferences wherein they discuss their weaknesses and vulnerabilities, their physical plant, their buildings, their property, where they're weak, where they're unprotected. Then they also have to balance that with, we want the people that come to church not to feel like they're in a police state. They don't want to see 85 uniformed officers standing around with shotguns in their hands either. So there has to be people who are trained and dedicated. It can be law enforcement, military people, ex-military or former military. If you live in a state where you have concealed weapons permits, there have to be people who are ready, who are prepared, who are stationed, and who just look like normal congregants, but yet they're trained, they know what to do. Video equipment, video surveillance equipment, Mm -hmm. unobtrusive is good. People that actually have on little badges or some kind of thing that just says security, and they're wandering around. They're seen out in the parking lot, in the buildings, while a worship service is going on. They're looking in closets and and empty sun Sunday school rooms, mm-hmm. for example, and office areas. Maybe have a golf cart or an automobile with somebody in it, just kind of patrolling yep. around, keeping an eye, looking. So anyway, I could talk for two hours on this, but <laughs> the measures that yeah. a church needs to take are not that difficult and they're not that expensive, but churches need to think about this. Let me build on what you're saying. I'm just off my understanding the Times Conference is a few weeks ago, and we had six, 7,000 people. That's over two days. Yes. And I had 22 men prowling around doing some of the things you're talking about. But yeah. I decided to, the leadership here decided to err on the side of caution and, and have 22 guys around there looking for trouble. And, yeah. you know, it's really tragic, gentlemen, that we've come to this point in society where we have to think and act this way, but we do. We do. Well, let me give you an example. It is tragic, but it's biblical. Let mm-hmm. me give you an it example. Is. And you both know this. Nehemiah, rebuilding the walls. I mean, he was sent back under a government order, under an executive order from the emperor, the Persian emperor. He goes back, but he's doing the kingdom work. He's doing the work of God. This was put in Nehemiah's heart by the Lord himself. And they go back, and they're rebuilding the walls to the city. Eventually, they'll get around to rebuilding the temple. I mean, this is kingdom work. But in the middle of it were the terrorists, Sanballat and his people. Mm. They were the the enemies of God's work and God's people. They continually breathed out threats. We're going to kill you. We're going to kill you. We're going to destroy the work of God. We're going to attack 
attack you. And so what did Nehemiah do? He gathers up the able-bodied men among them, many thousands of them, and he says, and I'm just going to paraphrase, he says, put a spear in one hand and a shovel in the other. Put a sword on your side, defend your families, defend yourself, and get on with the work of God. And they rebuilt the walls. And that's how churches are going to have to live today. You know, we've been blessed for the last 50 or so years in America, folks. But these days are changing. The times are changing. We're going to have to be reasonable and rational and biblical and thoughtful. We're going to have to be prepared. That's why I wrote this book. You know, it uh, it strikes me that this is also about the, the preservation of the gospel message itself, because it won't take too many really bad events That's in right. churches. Maybe one, maybe two probably not more than that, to make a lot of people say, you know, I I think this Christianity thing, I just won't investigate it like I was thinking about doing. They won't come to church. And that, of course, is an intimidation upon the very edict that God has given us to not forsake the fellowship with one another. And Mm -hmm. I I think meeting together in church, there's a dynamic there you can't get anywhere else. And I'm grateful. I live in a a real wasteland spiritually. In fact, Pierce County, Washington, where we live, is, is the number one least churched county in the United States. Wow. But uh, I heard a pastor there recently, a pastor that I know very well, make a statement kind of off the cuff about this and about how important this is for us to understand. And he made the example. He said, you know, Peter carried a sword. He just yes. didn't go steal one in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had one with him. Yes. And I think this is something that a lot of Christians want to try to ignore, especially those who maybe are intimidated by the idea of uh, the use of a firearm or understanding it. And I think each of us need to see this isn't about being the aggressor, but it's about stopping something that could really impede the gospel and mean souls kept out of heaven. You know, Eric, another brilliant and salient point. You mentioned Peter with the sword. Well, Peter not only had a sword, but he had the sword at Jesus' command. He was with his disciples that night, and he told them. He said, if you don't have a sword, I advise you now to go out and buy one. And let me paraphrase again, because this is the heart of Jesus' command and the gospel. Basically, he was telling them, look, times of chaos are going to come. <laughs> Troubled times. I mean, I'm going to a cross. My, I'm going to be raised from the, from the tomb. People are going to accuse you of stealing the body. They're going to be coming for you. They're going to be looking for you. I don't want you to be armed to go fight a war. I, I don't want you to try to overthrow the government. What I want you to do is to be prepared to defend yourself and your loved ones, your children, your family, the brothers and sisters in Christ around you, should that occasion occur. And you're right. Peter looked at Jesus. We've got two swords here among us right now. And Jesus said, that'll be enough. I think he smiled when he said that. <laughs> and, and then, of course, later on in the garden, we discover Peter has one. Now, Jesus rebuked him for using it that night. He had to talk him in off the ledge <laughs> because Peter was getting ready to slay the whole troop that came out. Jesus rebuked him because this Jesus didn't mean for him to stop what was happening. I mean, he, he told his disciples, look, they're coming for me tonight. I'm going to the cross. This is why I'm here. But the point is, Jesus himself told his disciples, you need to equip yourself with personal protection, and you need to be vigilant in this matter. Carl, and I I need just a little bit of a short answer here on this question, but we all know this is the elephant in the room right now, which we've referred to a couple times, I think. It's very possible that gun registration is on the horizon. Even gun confiscation could be on the horizon because we've got godless leftists out of control right now, and that and this is what they would like to do. But your thoughts on this, please? Yeah, I write about that in my book. Uh, well, as for me and my house, we're not going to give up our, our means to defend ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, and I know what that might mean, and people just have to make up their mind whether they're willing to pay that price. Because the bottom line, once a government, and you've written extensively about this, Jan, in your books, once a government de-arms its citizenry, then it enslaves its citizenry, That's right. or worse, or worse. And and so, you know, Christians have to make up their minds about this. But I personally will not relinquish my God-given right and responsibility to protect the innocent ones around me. Well, then what about going against the government? I mean, would yeah. you as a pastor say that it's okay to go against the government? Generally speaking, no, it's not. Romans 13 is clear, mm-hmm. and the rest of the scriptures are clear. However, when it comes to intrusion, Intruding upon our ability to defend our own lives, when it comes to our ability to proclaim our own faith, as Peter and John told the Sanhedrin, which were, by the way, appointed by the government, they operated under the auspices of the Roman rule, they told them, you know, you 
decide for yourselves whether you're going to serve God or man, but, but we're going to serve God because they were telling them, you know, you can't speak the name of Jesus anymore. And they said, well, we're going to defy this government rule because that goes against the very nature of God himself. So there is a balance to it all. Sure. I do address this in my book. You do. And that's why I think the book is important. That's